Uh, this morning, our presenter is uh, known as probably one of the subject matter experts uh, on the topic and in the discussion. Professor Mercer Baradaran uh, is an associate dean and uh, associate law professor. The law professor, you're full professor. Full professor. Look at you. <laughs> Uh, we, we, we got rank and chair and tenure and all of that good stuff, those things that are, you, absolutely, we like it. Job security is a good thing, uh, particularly when we start talking about money. And so uh, it is important that uh, we be able to hear uh, from her uh, this morning. Uh, she uh, is uh, on the faculty at the University of Georgia School of Law. Uh, she is well qualified. Uh, her two recent books, How the Other Half Banks and the Color of Money, I think you should all have and uh, read uh, to get some perspective. But you already got it. So we see, there you go. You're, you're ahead of the curve. And we're going to try to get this. I think the jump drive is... Having, having a little bit of an issue, but the file is there, but I'm not getting a response. Some our technician's gonna come and try to help us out. We've got everything set, but we wanna make sure that uh, we get started with the conversation. Uh, certainly, uh, Reverend, you want to bring greetings now? You wanna wait? Carry on, I've heard carry on from, from we, we can do that. Won't you, we are gonna start while we're waiting. Won't you uh, appreciate and welcome Professor Marissa Baradaran to the podium? Um, so I want to talk about the racial wealth gap, and I have some slides that, that show how large the racial wealth gap is and how it doesn't abate the more education you have. So with a college education, uh, the wealth gap is as big as it is without a college education. Uh, so, um, and uh, how it has not changed over time. So one of the slides has, um, in 1865, at the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, blacks owned, uh, yes, I will stand, sorry. Um, I'll, I'll, sh I'll stand, it's fine. So um, in 1860, I don't know if I could, I, if I pull, I, I can. Here, what if I sit right here? Can you see me here and then I'll just hold this? Is this okay? If you want to sit here, check. Okay, perfect. No, 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 we're good. Okay. Um, okay, so um, at 1865, uh, when the Emancipation Proclamation was, was signed, uh, blacks had 0.5% of the nation's wealth. That made sense. They were not allowed to own capital under slavery. They were themselves, their bodies were capital. Um, but today, uh, that wealth has not budged. It's about one to 1.5%. 1, 1 okay, so when we're talking about total wealth, that has a, a, is a catastrophe uh, of public policy over uh, 150 years of, of, of freedom. Uh, if you will, in quotes. Um, so uh, to, to say again that our public policy efforts to eradicate the racial wealth gap have been that's a it? failure. Yes, sir. Can that, I? That's yes, it? that's it. Okay, uh, so I'll run through these slides real quick and, and see what we can do here. Um, okay, so that, oh, there we go. Okay. No, okay, I'll just keep talking. Um, so uh, it's okay. goodness for the tech people, yeah? Yeah, My absolutely. Goodness. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so that's, those are the numbers. That is the share of wealth, which I've already uh, talked about a little bit. Um, so I want to consider how, uh, and, the, and what the book does is um, to consider how racism and racial exclusion exposes the myths surrounding uh, the market. Um, I want to focus specifically on black banks uh, because that's what I study is banking, but also because the history of black banks sheds light on the relationships between markets and state power, which I'll talk about. So I talked about yesterday, those were here, three myths about markets that I want to debunk here. The first is that money, markets, and trade exist in some realm outside of political power, okay? Um, two is that inequality this is a myth, is some natural byproduct of supply and demand of market forces as opposed to being created by state policy. Um, 
Three is that people, this is the third myth, and maybe this is gonna be controversial to some folks, is that people left outside of the structures of power can overcome these barriers through self-help or local institutions. So the idea is that for centuries, um, black communities have been trying to overcome the racial wealth gap themselves through very smart entrepreneurship, smart banking, and have not been able to overcome those superstructures of state power. And I'll talk about those in a second. So the promise of, of market, free market capitalism is that it does not discriminate. Does, does not discriminate, right? So free markets offer equal opportunity for all. Racism is supposed to be inefficient. Uh, one is supposed to prosper based on one's skill and ability to uh, produce. Um, yet history reveals that in fact markets do discriminate or alternatively, and this is where I fall, that the American economy has never borne any resemblance to a free market. For most of our history, blacks have been excluded from occupations, schools, neighborhoods, trades. Their property has not been protected by law. Um, money, likewise, is said to be apolitical. Uh, a revisionist history of money sort of likens money to water. It's neutral, it's colorless, it just goes here and there. Um, in fact, uh, the color of money for much of US history was white. Uh, white, too, was the color of government credit. In each historical moment where wealth is being created, so during the Homestead Act, FHA mortgage, cre mortgage credit and all of the uh, farm loan programs, black communities were shut out of land and wealth accumulation. That was money and wealth being created by state policy for whites, specifically for whites, right? This was embedded in the law. Moreover, and this is what my book wants to focus on, is that certain pivot points in history, reconstruction and civil rights, where black communities are demanding state intervention, capital, and to overcome a history of injustice, the rhetoric of free market capitalism is used as a weapon. And I'll explain those two circumstances in a second. Um, so self-help markets, blacks and, uh, black banks and black businesses are offered as a decoy, right? They're saying, you go have your own segregated economy, okay? Um, in other words, leaders upholding uh, the dominance of the white market institutions promised that the market a segregated market would fix the problems that law backed by private violence or, and public violence created, okay? So law and violence created the segregation and the racial wealth gap, and the policymakers are saying markets will fix it. Um, so this last myth is not limited uh, to racial exclusion. I have studied and wrote about this writ large, um, uh, that we use um, small community banks as a sort of solution to large macro problems. Um, so uh, we talk about microcredit, um, community banking, cooperatives, specifically for marginalized communities. And this goes back to Thomas Jefferson and is repeated every year with George Bailey of the, ba ba do you all know this movie? It's a Wonderful Life, okay. So, so the idea is that, um, so you know, there's two different ideas of where the country's going during the founding. Hamilton uh, pushed for a large, centralized, government-coordinated banking system. He believes that national banks and public credit, he says, is not a matter of mere private property, but a political machine of the greatest importance to the state. So Hamilton says, we're gonna be a large industrial nation, we need money, and we need the government to create that money. Jefferson is fearful of federal power, one, because he needs to protect slavery. The, the Constitution was written by Virginian slave owners, right? So, um, so we need to take that into account. But one of Hamilton's big ideas is we need local agrarian institutions and not national and wide. He is right, though, in noticing one thing and one fear, is that when you have capital that goes anywhere it wants, it's going to conglomerate in places like New York and Chicago. So he wants to break it down and make it small so that the common man, to him the white sort of yeoman farmer, is going to get access to this. Um, so Jefferson is wrong in his solutions. He's wrong about where the nation is going. We are not an agrarian economy. We are an industrial power. Um, but he's, he was right in his nightmare scenarios. If we let banks do whatever they want, if we let money go wherever it wants, we're going to have five banks controlling 80% of the U.S. assets. That's what we have right now. We just had the last merger uh, between Synovus, or sorry, SunTrust and BBT. That now makes five or six banks that control the U.S. economy. That's what Jefferson feared, okay? Hamilton's solution would be, let's make it public, okay? But we're still living in Jefferson's myth. Uh, so here comes George Bailey, okay? So the idea is that a group of poor people, and imagine them as farmers or coal miners or widows, 
um, living in a free market will pool their resources, lend to each other, and collectively lift themselves out of poverty. Um, and this idea has unfortunately seduced both the right and the left. And this is why I say I'm going to get some hate here. Um, uh, <laughs> Because we both pine for the noble Main Street community baker, banker who made America great. The left focuses on the nobility of Bailey, how good he is, and he is good. He wants things besides profit. And the right focuses on how cheap and easy a solution this is to a systemic problem. Uh, so you can be the change you want to see without actually having to change anything for J.P. Morgan. Um, neoliberal reforms create these mammoth banks, all underwritten by federal subsidies, um, and offer a hodgepodge of microcredit fantasies for those left out. So while J.P. Morgan gets $900 million a year just on interest in the reserves that they hold in the Federal Reserve, this is literally money that they're parking in the Federal Reserve, they get $900 million a year, we pat them on the back when they support a microcredit institution in Bangladesh, where mon women are themselves pooling money and lending to each other. Okay, so before you blame me for being too cynical, let me assure you that I spent the summer doing microcredit in Peru in college, and then I worked on Wall Street for ten years, and I was at the firm that helped create the Federal Reserve's Maiden Lane um, SPVs, the Special Purpose Vehicles, that funded the Federal Reserve trillions of dollars into AIG, JP Morgan, and Goldman Sachs. And that was nothing like a lending circle. That was money straight from, as uh, the Reverend said yesterday, the money tree, right? On the money mud, um, uh, which I wish I had that the way with words, because I think I would rename my book Money Mud. OK, um, so, so why, why am I taking this myth down? Because it is no exaggeration to say that community empowerment in one form or another is, is the foundational theory of every banking legislation over the last 30 years rooted at inequality or, ra uh, or the racial wealth gap. We keep going back to this model. So I'm talking about the CRA. I'm talking about the CDFI. I'm talking about opportunity zones. Um, so I'll get to those um, before you start throwing the tomatoes. I, I am going to oppose these, these really well-intentioned programs. These solutions are ineffective, but so clothed in goodwill that they're impossible to oppose, OK? Uh, but let me be very clear here. I have nothing against the George Baileys. Black banks especially have been at the heart of their communities. Black banks were founded by preachers, by community leaders, and leaders of the civil rights movement. Okay? Martin Luther King sat on a board of a black bank. Okay? Malcolm X pushed for black banking, and I'll get to those in a second. For, for the communities they served, black banks have been much bigger than their balance sheets. They have been a shield against ex economic exploitation. During the subprime crisis, no bank that I studied gave subprime loans. No black bank gave subprime loans to the communities that, that they served. Okay? And these banks have offered, um, as one banker says, a quasi-crusading role. They were the symbols and sites of community boycott and protest. They have stepped into the void created by Jim Crow and segregation to offer services amid exclusion. Um, in 2016, uh, oops, uh, there's Hamilton Jefferson. 2016, um, uh, Black Lives Matter uh, and, and other movements associated with it created the Bank Black push. And Killer Mike explains his motivation as one of protest. He says, take your money out of the dog's mouth. Okay, so this is a different meaning of black banks um, uh, that has been espoused by the uh, activists. Um, so uh, as community building, these, these institutions are uh, uh, amazing and irreplaceable. Um, but to control the black dollar, they don't work. And this is what I've tried to show in the book. Banking is a network. It's a system. Okay? And so when you, you can take deposits from blacks and you can lend to the black community, but you can't keep that money in the economy um, because the assets, if and, and it, this has always been true. If the assets are owned by whites and they're using a different banking system, it's impossible to keep that money in. And I've showed it through the balance sheets. And if, I'm not going to go through it here because it's a little bit complex, but the book, I think, will, will convince you. Um, these banks have not been able to overcome sort of the money-sucking centripetal pull of the dominant banking market. The same forces that created the need for these banks, so financial disenfranchisement, segregation, and poverty, were the same forces that impede their ability to grow wealth. Okay, so um, racism and housing segregation present 
barriers on their books. So if you look at the deposits are coming from small depositors in communities, that's very expensive for banks. Banks don't want small deposits. This is why they're giving you overdraft fees, okay? And when Bank Black started, a couple of black bankers are calling me. I've, I work with them a lot, and they're saying these deposits are killing us. Deposits are liabilities for banks. They're mini loans that the lender wants to keep taking in and out. That is not good business, okay? Loans, look at the assets. What do banks make money on? It's the loans, okay? That's where they get the interest. Um, and black banks have been lending on black properties. And the tragedy of black property that was true in the 1920s and is true today is that when a neighborhood turns into a black neighborhood, those property values plummet, okay? And that tipping point is somewhere between 5 to 10%, depending on what region, okay? So the first few black families come in, pay a premium, and then once it tips over, there's white flight and those neighborhoods plummet. So that, that is the banking scenario on the balance sheet. And then there is the money multiplier of banks. So banks multiply money as they lend through fractional reserve banking. I won't go into, but trust me on this. The more banks lend, the more money is created. Okay? The caveat is it has to be within the same system. Okay? So what black banks were doing was lending and then watching the money dissipate out of the community. Okay? All right, so I'm going to do a little quick history um, to demonstrate uh, the, uh, the following things. It's Black History Month, and maybe some of this history you haven't heard because people don't focus on the banks. Um, but I want to show one thing. Um, insofar as the levers of power were held by whites, hell-bent on white supremacy as labor control, um, and the economy was based on racial subordination, which it has been and is, uh, markets would perpetually block capital formation from black communities. Okay, so um, uh, I'll quickly pass over during Reconstruction. During Reconstruction, um, the freedmen were expected to make a transition from being capital to being capitalists. Freedmen and their abolitionist allies demanded land as a form of reparation and as punishment for the treasonous Confederates, right? The question was, should we hang them or just take their land, okay? Um, without land, Frederick Douglass and others understood that freedom and justice would be meaningless and participation in capitalism would be a farce. President Andrew Johnson vetoed the land grant and the Freedmen's Bill. He said this will be a white man's government. Um, he reasoned, and this is where the rhetoric of capitalism comes in, that freedmen would be protected by the free market and contract law, that they would just bargain for fair wages and buy their own land. This was unbelievably naive or incredibly cynical. The southern economy was nothing like a free market. Whites refused to sell property to blacks. Southern legislators, lawyers, and judges drafted laws governing every aspect of black labor. Their contracts were not protected. Um, they were restricted from skilled trades. Vagrancy laws were prevalent. Wages were capped by cabal between employers. And violations led to convict labor without due process. Okay, so the legal system was manufactured not as a free market. It was a, another form of slavery. Um, by the end of Reconstruction, the freedmen were landless, voteless, and with practically every profession blocked to them, their only choice was to grow cotton. But that was the point. That was the point of the whole system. The worldwide cotton market was heavily dependent on cheap and abundant cotton for the United States. As the Civil War is going on, um, bankers in Liverpool are worried about their cotton um, supply, okay? And so what had happened in Haiti, they're watching in Haiti with, with a very worried eye. So what happened in Haiti is when the slaves revolted and got their freedom, mm -hmm. they got land. And what do you grow if you have your own land? You grow food to eat, okay? You don't grow cotton. Cotton is, is a debt crop. It's a slave crop. In order to force people to grow cotton, you have to force them to grow cotton by making every other means unavailable. So the southern planters and the northern capitalists understood that if slaves got land, they would not get that cheap cotton anymore. And so they deprived them of their land. Um, as James, James Baldwin called Reconstruction, a bargain between the north and south to this effect. We've liber liberated them from the land and delivered them to their bosses. Um, in the meantime, by the way, the federal government is giving away land through the Homestead Act to white settlers um, through Manifest Destiny. Um, uh, so, so instead of getting land, though, and this is the part where it gets super interesting and cynical, um, the freed slaves get a bank. It's called the Freedmen Savings Bank. They get it in 1865. And it is sold to them as, by the 
uh, reformers, the Republicans and the Democrats, the Democrats don't oppose this, but the Republicans, the, the good sort of reformers say, look, this is better than land because it will teach you about thrift and saving. I mean, this is like financial education. Just you will gain land respectfully. You will earn it as if hundreds of years under slavery was not earning the land. Um, so um, the Freedmen, they said, uh, should earn the land instead of receiving it as a gift. So the Freedmen Savings Bank was the only tangible creation of the Reconstruction Era Freedmen's Bureau. No bank before or since has resembled this bank. It was created by Congress, signed into law by Lincoln. The Federal Reserve was still decades away, okay? We did not have, at this time, a national currency. The greenback was just issued, okay? The bank, though, was immediately successful and embraced by all the slaves, um, of freedmen, sorry, at this point, and a few Irish who couldn't get bank accounts at other places. Mm -hmm. The reason that this bank was successful is because those were the, those were the actual bills and uh, notes of the bank. So at the time, if you're J.P. Morgan, and J.P. Morgan was around then, right, uh, these capital, Pots don't die. Um, if you're J.P. Morgan and you hand a $100 note to someone, that's worth $100. If you're some podunk bank in Michigan and you give a $100 note to someone, that is not worth $100 because that person is not sure you're going to redeem it. Okay? To give notes worth $100 with Lincoln's face on it seemed to indicate, and this was every intent, this was their intent, that this was backed by the full faith and credit of the Treasury. It was not. It was run by white management. Um, it was supposed to be a big savings bank. No loans. It was supposed to be like a glorified piggy bank just to keep your money safe. It did not do that. So that money, $1.5 billion in today, um, Henry Cook was the president. His brother was Jay Cook, infamous railroad speculator. Um, railroads were like the subprime market of today back then. He took $1.5 billion of money and uh, speculated it away. So the depositors lost half of their savings that they never got back. No one got prosecuted. Nobody went to jail. Um, W.E. Du Bois says in his, uh, his magisterial black reconstruction, he says, not even 10 additional years of slavery could have done so much to throttle the thrift of the freedmen as the mismanagement and bankruptcy of the Freedmen's Bank chartered by the nation for their special aid. Now, I started this project not intending to write about black banks. People are like, why are you, why did you? write this. I, I write about the unbanked. I write about payday lending. I write about usury, all of that stuff. I started looking at FDIC data and um, noticing that in the South, 60%, so the unbanked and underbanked are about 10% worldwide, uh, nationwide. So 10% of people don't have access to a bank. Bigger percent, like maybe 15% are underbanked. In the South, for the black population, that is something like 60%, which is a phenomenally unbanked and underbanked population. And one of the main reasons they were saying, and I was looking in the interviews, is that they don't trust banks, okay? And as I dug through this history, I noticed a lot of people 100 years later talking about the Freedmen's Bank. In other words, people who lost their savings at this you know, uh, government bank saying, um, I'm not gonna put my savings in, in a bank anymore. Um, but uh, there was another sort of, um, uh, dual uh, legacy of this bank uh, as well. Um, I'll just skip here. Um, after the Freedmen's Bank, there's a lot, uh, the, um, the, the, a lot of black bankers were trained after the Freedmen's Bank. So the Freedmen's Bank fails in 1873. Between 1873 and 1910, it is heavy Jim Crow in the South, lots of hostility and violence. You have a lot of banks like Maggie Walker's bank um, formed during this time. Maggie Walker is the first black woman, oh, sorry, first black banker inducted into the Virginia Bankers Association because she was such a good banker. She was the first woman of any race to own a, her own bank. Okay, um, And a lot of the banks during this time resembled Maggie Walker's bank. So Maggie Walker was um, involved in the St. Luke's Penny Society. There was a lot of you know social fraternal societies, churches. So Maggie Walker starts the bank. She, she starts a college education fund. She, starts she gives away 600 mortgages to the people in her community. She... Um, has a printing press, uh, she writes books. I mean, she is just everything um, in this community. And she also, um, her bank is a say, uh, survives the Great Depression because she merges a bunch of banks into hers. There's only five black banks that survive the Great Depression, and hers is one of them. And she becomes the president of the National Bankers Association, which is the black 
um, uh, banking uh, sector. Her bank actually, her actual, not her, but her bank survives until the 2008 financial crisis, and it's, uh, yeah. Um, okay, so um, it, let's revel in, in the good history before we move on to the bad again. Okay, so um, during the northward migration, as you all know, um, millions of blacks escaping the southern hostility but also being attracted by north, northern labor um, cross up to the north and they are met with heavy segregation and concentrated uh, black populations in areas in you know, Chicago, New York, et cetera. This is the heyday of black banking. About 130 banks are formed during this time. And, and, and if you're gonna read the book, I would recommend, if you're not convinced that segregated banking doesn't work, read this chapter, because this is where I talk about if segregated banking is ever going to work, it is going to be between 1910 and 1930. You have 100% segregation, basically. You've got blocks that are just black, blocks that are just white or immigrant or whatever. Um, but, but, these, but, but the scenarios are, are not uh, working for these banks. Okay, so I'll move on from there. Um, uh, okay, so you're seeing a lot of segregation. Um, and then you also have banks like Chase Manhattan, right, who are taking deposits from Harlem and lending them downtown. Um, and uh, one bank manager, I, I, I found a thesis from 1936 where he readily admits this. And he says something like, um, you know, it was too risky to lend uptown because black, black business people are not entrepreneurial. They don't know how to run business, so therefore we're depriving them of business loans. And it reminds me of this George Bernard Shaw quote where he says, um, the haughty American nation makes the Negro clean its boots and then proves the moral and physical inferiority of the Negro by the fact that he is a shoe black. Okay? So they were saying, these people are not entrepreneurial and we're not gonna lend them loans. And therefore, there's no entrepreneurship because you can't start a business without a loan. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to skip. Oh, this is a money multiplier. I'm not going to go into that right now. Okay. Um, so then you have the New Deal, um, which makes um, segregation explicit. It restructures the U.S. banking and credit market through heavy state intervention. Um, so I want to be clear about something. The New Deal didn't just have a blind spot on race. Okay. In other words, it's not as though they intended to help everybody and they just, it was so racist at the time that they put you know, red lines around black communities, no. The New Deal was passed by the Southern legislature who was explicit that blacks shall not be included in these, in these things, okay? Um, Ira Katz Nelson, the historian, calls it white affirmative action, and it was so. so. Let me explain what the New Deal does. So between 1933 and 1970, hundreds and thousands of community banks, credit unions, thrifts um, are formed. This is the era of the George Bailey Bank. This is when we mythologize the community banker. The reason these small banks are thriving is because the New Deal takes the risk out of banking. Deposits are insured by the FDIC, so no more bank runs, and loans are subsidized by the FHA, the GI Bill, the Farm Loan Programs, right. and Fannie Mae. Right. Okay? So banks, I, I teach my class 363 lending. Mandated by law, you're paying 3% on deposits, insured by the FDIC, 6% on loans, insured by the FHA, you're on the golf course by 3 p.m. Because there's literally nothing to think about. Okay? So that's, that is when banks are printing money. That is when George Bailey is doing the thing that he's doing. All of this built the middle class. It's not as though they gave loans to middle class people. It's that they took blue collar people from cities and said instead of paying $50 a month on rent, pay $35 a month, and I'm using real numbers, on a mortgage in Levittown. All white mortgages, or all white communities that create the, 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 the mythical America where we're trying to make America great was created through this New Deal program. In return, banks are heavily regulated. We've got interest rate caps, all sorts of stuff. Um, uh, so um, the New Deal was built on uh, redlining, okay? So here, what we're doing is we're segregating. The, we're, we're saying that the communities um, that are green or blue are safe loans, and the FHA will insure your loan if you're lending into there. That's Chicago. Um, the neighborhoods that are red, um, are risky. So I have, I think I have, okay, so here's one I l dug up. This is an actual, I don't know if you can see it, you might not be able to, but this is actually from Atlanta. That red area right there is Morehouse and Spelman. Wow. As you see from the top, it says, this is the best Negro neighborhood 
in Atlanta. It was probably the best Negro neighborhood in the country. And it says professionals, um, businessmen, uh, so all men at the time, um, and, they're, and they're homeowners, okay? Um, so if you look at that top thing, it says percentage, uh, so occupation, men, clerical workers, that's very good. Um, Foreign-born families, 0%, so that's good. Any foreign-borns like immigrants. Negro families, 100%. And then the next line is infiltration of. So what is the risk of foreign-born people and Negroes coming into this community and the percentage of risk, okay? That, that is the top indicator. This is a real FHA form. And so they're saying, if you're black, you can be wealthy, you can be a university professor, you can own your house, but you are still a risk, and we will not lend to your home. Okay, so this is how segregation and the racial wealth gap is solidified in our time. So what is happening here is not just the mortgage loans. There is a, um, and these HOLC map makers, I wanna be clear, these are not hooded Klansmen walking around the neighborhoods, right? These are government bureaucrats putting in law and, and forms, the FHA was giving manuals saying, Developers, you need to try not to have a racially inharmonious neighborhood. What does ra racially inharmonious mean? Not fully white, okay? So you have developers being told, hey, build, and this happened in St. Louis. There was a black community that was coming too close. The infiltration of the white community was uh, too close. And so they built a solid concrete wall that had no other purpose but to segregate one community from another. One got FHA loans, one didn't, okay? One thing that happens during this era is, so and the white economy grows by leaps and bounds, and the segregated black economy becomes locked in a state of perpetual uh, depression, as Martin Luther King calls it. Because on top of the FHA loans, there's something else that's going on. So let me go back to the maps real quick. So in the white suburb, and this is something that we don't focus on, there's also FHA consumer loans. This is the post-war era where everyone's starting to buy a car, a refrigerator. I mean, this is the era where like, truly America's great. We're coming back from the war. We're buying all sorts of stuff for our house, and we're buying it on credit. We're buying it on cheap credit. In the white suburb where wealth is accumulating, and wealth is accumulating fast, by the way, because these houses are increasing in value. And, oh, by the way, the, the men that are coming back from the war are going to college with a GI Bill. Black soldiers either get it or don't get it because there aren't universities that will accept them. But that, that's another story. Um, so what's happening as the wealth is building up is that there's also a consumer credit market that is built atop of the mortgage credit market. So consumer credit is the money you use to buy for your, buy your couch, your TV, and your, uh, not TV, I don't know, refrigerator. Okay. Um, so in the white suburb, they're using revolving credit. And revolving credit is like a credit card, okay? And what revolving credit allows you to do is have a credit card or your, may, you know, Woolworths card or whatever, and you can go to the, any store, and the revolving credit, what, how it works in the credit markets is you can sell it up to the secondary markets. Remember I talked about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac? One of the things that's really interesting about credit is it's becoming securitized during this time. So what securitized credit means is that you're lowering the risk. You're bundling a whole bunch of people's credit risks, and you're allowing more capital to flow in the system. This is happening with consumer credit in the white suburb and revolving credit. Revolving credit is low interest. It's highly flexible. Um, in the black ghetto, and I'm going to call it ghetto um, because that is the term that people used at the time. It was not a black neighborhood because that would imply that it was chosen freely. It was not. It was backed again by violence and, and power. Um, so in the black ghetto, what's happening is not revolving credit, not just because of racism, but because of the different market structure and wealth. So what's happening in the black ghetto is installment credit. And installment credit is night and day from revolving credit. What is installment credit is you're buying your refrigerator, same item, you're paying 10 to 20 times more for the product. So think of Rent-A-Center. That was the only credit available in the ghetto. And you're paying your hospital bill, your doctor, your school tuition, if you have one, through installment. And what installment means, the way that they would put these contracts together is they would bundle all the payments into one contract. And if you missed, let's say you're buying a refrigerator and a, a couch and a car or whatever, you're bundling them all together. And if you miss one payment, you lose everything. Okay, and the, the interest rates were incredibly high. So I, so I wanna, um, and the default, 
the, involves repo men, cops. It's not a default like you would get the, a creditor calling you. They're showing up at your house. They're taking your stuff. Um, okay, so the early before there was a Montgomery bus boycott, groups in Harlem and Chicago are protesting these arrangements, these installment lenders. Okay, in Harlem, boycotts are even sanctioned by the court. So there's a court decision in 1935 that opens up the ro uh, room for Martin Luther King's boycott movement. So this, this judge in Harlem says, so a bunch of people are boycotting these installment lenders, a uh, black activists, and this judge and 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 the and the business is saying this is illegal. You can't boycott us for racism. And the judge says, absolutely, you can. So this opens up the door for community boycotts, the type that um, Reverend Jackson uh, really sort of used to great effect in Chicago. But this court decision allows for this. But they're focusing on the money issue, as Reverend Jackson and other early civil rights leaders um, did as well. Um, so the, 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 they saw economic um, uh, autonomy that's going hand in hand with civil rights. So this is Malcolm X, um, you know, why should white, and of course the black nationalists, that makes sense. Why should white people be running the banks of our community? So he wants autonomy. But let me be clear here. When Malcolm X was talking about autonomy, he saw the ghetto as a colony, okay? He saw, he linked up the black ghetto with the anti-colonialization efforts worldwide. Yeah. So he's saying we are being colonized by white exploiters. We want not just banks, we want sovereignty. Okay, we want to control our schools, our hospitals, our school boards. Okay, um, and then Martin Luther King. I have a little speech. So this is a lot to put on a slide. Let, let me just go back. Um, in 1954, Martin Luther King takes the case uh, in, to Eben, in Ebony, uh, the, his movement um, to the black population. He has a five or six point plan on civil rights. His top two. Number one is coordinate community banks for boycotts. Two is coordinate credit unions for boycotts. Number five is voting, okay? So he did see community empowerment through financial capital uh, as, as really relevant to the struggle. This is his I Have a Dream speech, which we focus on the wrong parts. And Reverend Al Sharpton talked about this yesterday. He says, look at the blank check. Look at this from a banking perspective. Again, he's saying, we have come to cash a check. Um, he says, they were signing a promissory note this note uh, guaranteed all men, um, guaranteed unalienable rights. It's obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note. America has given Negroes a bad check, a, a check which has marked back insufficient funds, but we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vault of opportunity of this nation. And so we've come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. This man understood how banks worked, okay? And he is asking for a financial reckoning, a financial justice, okay? Call it reparations, call it justice, call it what you will, but he's not asking for color blindness. He is not saying, you know, judge me by the color. He is saying that, but he's also saying, you have deprived us of what was rightfully ours, okay? Um, so, uh, and this is his last speech before he's, um, assassinated, he says, uh, he goes to Memphis, and we talk about the Memphis, a high on the mountaintop, but he says, I want to take, you, take your money out of the banks downtown and put them in the tri-state bank. We want a bank in movement in Memphis. I'm sure uh, Reverend Jackson knows this movement intimately, but they were, by this time, all over Chicago, taking money out of banks, taking money out of businesses, and protesting. So there's very much an economic movement. Okay, so things get complicated. Um, after the civil rights laws are passed, um, Harlem, Detroit, Watts erupts, okay? And what's happening is um, destruction of white property and um, uh, uh, protest against exploitation. I wanna go, come back to this. Um, uh, so, but I do wanna end on one quote that uh, the Martin Luther King section on one quote. He says, Martin Luther King said about the segregation in the North, the underlying purpose of segregation was to oppress and exploit the segregated not simply to keep them apart. The basic purpose of segregation was to perpetuate injustice and inequality. So going back to my earlier myth about um, poverty and inequality being created, Martin Luther King was very explicit about this. This is not some random thing. Okay, so um, um, everything changes. Uh, again, the people, there are people here who lived through this and usually when I talk, um, I, I don't have this sort of audience but I'll just, 
go forward anyway and be corrected. Um, Everything changes between 1965, when the civil rights laws are passed, and 1968. Um, the civil rights law, the voting rights law, Brown versus Board of Ed, Montgomery bus boycott, Selma march, all of this happens before 1965, okay? The national appetite for civil rights reform had so evaporated by 1966 that Roy Wilkins of the NAACP says, it would have been hard to pass the Emancipation Proclamation in the atmosphere in 1966 and 1967. And by 1969, Malcolm X, King, John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy had all been killed and Johnson is out of office, okay? The consensus of the black community, including Reverend Jackson, about civil rights is that it has either it's either incomplete or it has failed to account for the things that needed to be done. Okay, so yes, these laws were great, but these laws were the bare minimum. All the civil rights laws did was to guarantee to the black population the rights they were already supposed to be guaranteed in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Okay, so this is now just saying we're serious this time, and the federal government's gonna back it up. Okay, um, the whites only signs are gone, but in the Federal Reserve does a, a study in 1967 that says blacks have one fifth the wealth of black of white families, and half of black children are growing up in deep poverty, compared to nine percent of white children. So these protests erupt, and um, people think of it as a domestic war, right? A CBS announcement says it's an insurrection against all authority, and there's a bunch of commissions that convene to study these riots. What is the purpose? We're so confused. Why are you complaining? Okay, so the Kerner Commission that is uh, convened by President Johnson says um, it's scathing. It says, what, what white Americans have never fully understood but what the Negro can never forget is that white society is deeply implicated in the ghetto. White institutions created it, yep. white institutions maintain it, and white society condones it. Yep. Then there's these hearings in the Senate Banking Committee, of which some members will come later. Senate, well, they're the House members, but in the Banking Committee, they study these riots specifically. And they find... Um, Three things, I'm gonna have to be quick here. Three things about these, these riots. One is that the rioters are tank targeting the lenders. And they're saying things like, burn the books. Okay, this is not random violence. They know who their exploiters are. Two is that they're leaving alone black businesses, or what Jacob Javits calls soul brother establishments. And three, and this is supported by all of the studies, and this is gonna sound complicated and a little bit crazy, but these lenders aren't making profits, okay? 95% of that high cost of lending is because they're operating in a different market. They have higher defaults, there's lower wealth, mm -hmm. all of the, the, the mix of conditions created by the FHA maps makes it such that these bankers cannot. Okay, so the response is, by a lot of policymakers, we'll throw more black lenders in, and that'll fix it, okay? Instead of actual capital or integration or whatever, we're just gonna have more black banks. Okay, so the, the winning candidate here is Richard Nixon, who um, uh, uh, can't say this is a white man's government like Andrew Johnson did, but is essentially saying that, okay? He rides a white backlash into office. He takes the language of the black power movement um, and uses it to propose his civil rights agenda. And I've been in the Nixon archives for months. Everyone wants to look at the Vietnam stuff, and I'm looking at the campaign materials, and the stuff that the, these guys wrote in paper is phenomenally astounding. So um, he writes a memo to Congress saying, I promise to lay off the Negro crap, okay? He understands that he is not gonna get any political points for pushing forward on civil rights. So he uses black capitalism. This is his campaign announcement. I, I usually play it. Let me see if it'll let me. I don't know if it will. Ah, yes. I don't know if I'm complicating it by doing this, but. Oh, no. Okay, there it is. Richard Nixon speaks on black oh. capitalism. White-owned enterprises employ a greater number of Negroes, yeah. whether as laborers or middle management personnel. This is needed, but it has to be accompanied by an expansion of black ownership, of black capitalism. We need more black employers, more black businesses. Integration must come, but in order for it to come on a sound and equal basis, the black community has to be built from within, even as the old barriers between black and white are dismantled from without. We have to get private enterprise into the ghetto, but at the same time, Sorry. 
Okay, so one interesting thing on that last point, he says it's time to move past the old civil rights. In the archives, there's five different drafts of this speech, and in the first several, it says, forget civil rights, right? And then someone puts, move beyond, and then someone puts, it's time to move past the old civil rights. The message is the same. We're not pushing forward on civil rights. One, one uh, uh, interesting side note on this is George Romney is his HUD commissioner, and George Romney, when you hear George Romney, it's talking about segregation, it's almost like hearing the Black Panthers, okay? He is talking, he says, the white suburb is like a noose around the black ghetto. This is George Romney. And he pushes several integration plans, and finally Nixon, after two years, sends him to Mexico and, and makes him leave. Okay, so, so what is black capitalism? Nixon co-opts black, um, black power, and what he does is he puts treasury deposits um, into banks. He um, starts affirmative action, he asks, businesses politely to hire more black people, all great. Um, uh, and he uh, also uh, starts set-asides, contract set-asides to black businesses. That gets, you know, the Supreme Court sort of um, puts that aside. Why does this matter? Okay, so I'm gonna, I gotta wrap up. I can't go through, through all of the interesting um, things that happen after Nixon, but I'll just be quickly. Ronald Reagan really takes this message. So let me just go back to this, the intellectual, apparatus here. So Milton Friedman, Lewis Powell, John Olin, the Olin Foundation, is one of the biggest funders of, um, of right-wing groups here. Um, Alan Greenspan was the Fed chairman. Lewis Powell writes this thing called the Powell Memo that teaches the right how to uh, uh, oppose the left. So the theory that I put in the book is Milton, so these, these, you know, we call them neoliberal, libertarian. Barry Goldwater is one of their standard bearers. Nixon is, um, becomes um, uh, their sort of, you know, executor in chief. These guys um, push forward the free market capitalism that you see pervading everything. Let markets do it, deregulate, government bad, markets good, okay? Um, I, again, I, I think I demonstrate in the book that these men were reacting specifically to the civil rights demands um, for capital. Because what you see in this moment, these ideas are out there, have been for a while. As soon as black communities say, we would like a cut of what you all have been doing in the, the other markets, what Nixon and Greenspan come back with is capitalism. Mm. Capitalism will, will fix it. This is what Andrew Johnson did in the early Reconstruction as well. And it's very explicit. So Greenspan writes memos to Nixon. And I, I showed these in the book. I, I, I hope I can convince you. But Nixon, Greenspan writes Nixon and says, um, about the urban riots, anything you do, either reparations or integration, is anti-capitalist. We're going to head down to the road of communism if you respond in any other way. John Olin goes to the Cornell campus for uh, Alumni Day and sees the Black Power protest, and that's when he starts the Olin Foundation to fund these right-wing groups. Milton Friedman opposes the civil rights laws because he says they're just like the Nuremberg Codes, they're market intervention. Um, Lewis Powell organizes the right to fight all civil rights advances. Okay, so the reason why this, is, this matters is because we are still living in this reality, okay? These people still control all of the rhetoric about markets. The word efficiency, the word, you know, profits, markets, all of that stuff is relatively new, okay? So Reagan um, starts black owned business. I'm not gonna leave her alone the Democrats. I'm very sorry about this. Um, Clinton um, doubles down on this. So he um, starts the CDFI fund, um, uses Shore Bank and microcredit as his, this is a little clip, I won't play because I'm out of time. Um, he does a clip about microcredit. So Mohammed Yunus, the Grameen Bank, comes to Shore Bank, is motivated there. And he says Clinton's whole big economic agenda is um, community empowerment. So when we were calling the, uh, black communities the ghetto, now we're calling them empowerment zones, niche markets. And I'm gonna make a lot of enemies here, but Cory Booker just called them, it's too good to pass up, domestic emerging markets, okay? Lawrence Summers, uh, Clinton's advisor, says this is win-win. The entrepreneurs will come and um, they will find the profits that have been laying on the ground this whole time, okay? They're niche markets. We're gonna use indigenous lenders um, to fix this, okay? This is, again, 
problems created by segregation and public policy. Um, and the assumption here is that black bankers haven't been trying for hundreds of years to wring profits from these neighborhoods and dealing with this radically different structure. So th these are the policy. Barack Obama didn't do all that much. Trump opportunity zones, I didn't get to um, further the slide here. Um, what, so this whole infrastructure that Nixon created as part of his Southern strategy, his strategy was law and order, but the other side was black capitalism. And with black capitalism, we haven't probed as much of because it's harder to dig at what is going on here. And I want to tell you that what's going on is that instead of responding to the civil rights movement's demands, they gave this other thing. They were asking for bread and they got a stone. And this stone has not yielded profits. It's impossible to because what you're saying is we're going to keep segregation intact. You're not going to have capital. So Hubert Humphrey opposing Nixon says, you can't have black capitalism without capital. But that's exactly what Nixon was doing. In fact, one of his advisors, Abe Venable, who was the head of OMBE, the only African American who was hired, he was the highest ranked, did a plan, $8 billion in capital to these areas. And um, Maurice Sands, who's the Commerce Department uh, chair of Nixon, writes him and says, no, this is not about money. You don't understand. And I'm quoting here. He says, we need stories of black entrepreneurs. We need what the people, what the black people need more than anything else is stories of success, OK? Um, and uh, he talks about Horatio Alger, right? So we, we need to motivate people to do this stuff and not actually give them capital. OK. Um, um, and I, so I want, so uh, maybe I'll close here because I really do uh, have to stop. Um, the, the errors, we, we have used in our history several dogmas to justify racial exploitation and inequality. So during slavery, we bastardized Christianity, right? Or the white slave owners did, not we. But we, they said that God created the white man as capital. Um, and the black man is labor. This is word for word, you know, what they're saying. That God deemed the white man to be the owner of the black man. That was that was the myth that justified in slavery, then, or slavery. Then after those myths go out, then we're using social Darwinist Darwinism, right? The pseudoscience of, oh, we, we measured skulls and bodies, and it looks like the white man, and not just all white men, not the Irish. The white man is just, you know, nature's highest uh, order, the most evolved being, and then down, and we've got these scientific measurements. There was one insurance company. This is why black insurance was the only successful market, is insurers used this data to say, and I kid you not, that the black race was going extinct because of their health problems. And they said, this is not caused by poverty and labor. Oh. This is a racial trait. Oh. OK? Um, so that, that is used. And then that falls out of favor because the Nazis kind of put that to use. right? They're like, OK, this is what we're going to do. And then the, the Americans couldn't do it. I, I want to claim that now what we're using to justify inequality is the laws of the market, OK? Um, which has replaced the laws of God. Um, so economic theory, the laws of supply and demand, are a reason that black labor is undervalued and credit costs so much. Any effort to change these markets is harmful government interference uh, with what Reagan called the magic of the marketplace. And just as God's will was difficult to oppose in the 1700s, so too, um, if you oppose the markets, you're labeled as a heretic, a communist, a socialist. Um, but what I hope I've, I've showed and I hope I can show in the book is that it's never been a free market. It has always been a mixed market of federal government subsidies and uh, some markets. The only place, actually, where there has never been a subsidy is in the black ghetto. Um, now there's a little bit more, but taking into account the FHA, the Homestead Act, and all of the other government programs before it, it has only been the black ghettos where the cost of credit has been paid by the people. Other places, it's been underscored. So if we're going to talk about markets, let's talk about markets. But if we're not talking about markets, then let's call it what it is. So that so I will end there. There's a lot more, and I, I'm running out of time, so I'm sorry. <laughs> So we're, we're grateful for uh, the presentation in condensed form, and hopefully you will uh, get a copy of the book and read it, uh, test uh, the assertions and the premises. I think it's an important and essential conversation in real time. Uh, I want to do this very quickly because uh, Professor Baradaran has got to go.
Uh, she, yeah, we, she'll be back. The one question I want to put on the table, and maybe this will help get to some of them. What would, if you had the opportunity to make a single, let's say, policy recommendation, right? Because markets are reinforced by political power. What's the policy proposal that you put on the table and why? Um, reparations, and we're not talking little, I mean, we can talk about reparations in any way. There was a lot of good programs proposed in the 60s and 70s. Core almost passed a reparations bill in Congress. We're talking about Federal Reserve financing, actual capital, and it's got to be large, something like trillions of dollars. I have a, a Homestead Act that we talked about earlier, giving properties to people in those redlined areas. So we've got abandoned properties in Baltimore, just handing those over, like we did with the Homestead Act. Going back to those pivotal moments where, where wealth was created for white Americans and doing that for black Americans. Um, so, so it's got to have capital, um, and it's got to be a lot of money. Um, and the money problem is not, we don't need to finance it by taxes. You can read more in the book, but the Federal Reserve can make money. The Federal Reserve spent $4.5 trillion buying up the assets of AIG and JP Morgan and all of those assets. They're still on the Federal Reserve's books. And the Federal Reserve can make profits from those. So I'm not talking about tax people and take, I'm taking, I'm saying take the $4.5 billion, trillion dollars, sorry, that you took in buying those assets and buy up homes in Detroit and Baltimore and those areas and hand them over and make your profits as you will, but use the Federal Reserve financing for the people because the Federal Reserve is a public institution. Okay, So this is where I get back to public banking. When you understand banking and the Hamiltonian concept of banking, all banking, all money is public money. Money is not some gold nugget that we dig out of a mountain. We create money. As Reverend Jackson said yesterday, you can make money from trees if you have got money mud. Right? And that's essentially a way, that is how you describe the Federal Reserve. They just make money as long as they can support it through the balance of trade and watch out for inflation. But inflation, we spent $4.5 trillion in um, stimulus, not zero inflation. Okay? We are now the central banking to the world. The dollar, we're not worried about China. Don't worry about China. The dollar is the world's currency. Okay? We are using it. Everyone is investing in the dollar. They're getting 2% on treasuries. We can increase that. Okay? We, we, we can use the dollar to create infrastructure. We can use the money that, that is being created by these investments to, to, to invest in these communities. There's a lot that can be done here, but we just have to change our idea, our understanding of why these problems exist. So, Mercer, before you go, last point, Reverend Jackson's going to come with uh, his question and final remarks. He's going to close this out. I also want to get a sense of, are you open to, because I know we've got more to deal with, can we coordinate, using the business of technology, a follow-up session, maybe via Zoom or Skype? Absolutely. Can we do that? All right, good. So we'll put that on the table. Uh, and so if you want that information, make sure we have your contact information that you were in this session. Give us your email address so we can figure out when to schedule that because I think there's a lot more uh, that uh, the professor wanted to share uh, and we want to hear. Can we appreciate Mercer Baradaran one more time? And, and the reason we're able to to have her here is because in the genius of uh, our leader, he wants to expose us to critical thought. And so I want him to come as, in his own way, one, because he's the boss, <laughs> but most importantly, he's the inspiration. Let's appreciate our leader, Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr. as he comes this morning. Good morning. One thing I wanted to do was to pull together not so much a mass meeting, but a critical number of us to think through what's next. I would, I would share with you that there's no one in Washington this morning thinking about this. Mm -hmm. We're talking about. So if we don't figure it out, it won't be figured out. The abolition, this movement came from those who need to be a, a, a freed. freed. And so one of my concerns, I have Dr. Pleasant, who's a PhD in economics, and Dr. Mesra, is the core of us going to put together our own plan for emancipation. Now, what I mean is, for example, the question you asked, Reverend, about Europe got reparations not based upon race history, mm -hmm. based upon the war. So they got 50-year loans of 2% government secured. 
you take effort to fill with that. Fifty year loans, two percent government insurance, and 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 and, and sixty years of military protection. Mm -hmm. So they got federal protection and fifty year loans. We don't have government protection and don't get the long term loans. That's that's a way to think about this. And, 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 the, and the, the not just homestead zones, but wherever you live, you should have access. If if you're categorized as black. Wherever you live, you be living in, in Wyoming or living in, in, in Maine, wherever you are, you should have access to that arrangement because the government, slavery is a government supported institution and so is segregation. So whatever happens, it will require new and different law. Now, one thing that you have said, and I'm anxious to talk when you, you get back, uh, in reaction to Jimmy Carter in some extent, not including certain people, um, Hosea and Ralph endorsed Nixon in Detroit. Nixon came to Chicago to meet with our black business people. We, we were having an expo, which involved Joe Lewis Milk and Independence Bank and Sibley Bank and the like. And um, he couldn't meet with them because all of them were at the expo. Bob Brown said to Nixon, the, the leadership is over at the expo displaying their business wares. Nixon's reaction was black capitalism. Mm -hmm. He was just saying something. It never, it never had, because capitalism without capital is like swimming without water. <laughs> it was, it was gravy without meat. Mm He's -hmm. just, just saying something. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that when we put together this, this thing, uh, we had Independence and Seabay Bank at that time, but as they grew, they also became marketable and they sold them. Mm -hmm. They sold them. They became marketable because, and then the big banks moved in with, uh, with, with, with community banks, then they moved out. Because none of them were left without, without community banks or community health centers. And the, and the black banks once had their empty buildings now. So let's think about it. My last point would be uh, we need some access people like you to get access to mass media. If, 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 all, if all we're hearing every day is radio disc jockeys right. and TV and can't ever hear you, that's cultural genocide. Right. Right. So you have the information here and the masses here. There's a gap between what we know and the reality. We live. We're not even working on this. Right. We have 55 Congress people, for the most part, for the most part, they're not even working on this. Now, Maxine Walls will be here at noontime. She's working on it to some extent because Maxine now has, if you will, a subpoena power. And she is very sensitive to the role that banks must play in ending the exploitation. Because when we made our move uh, with the housing thing in the late 90s, uh, you need to come up for a minute, Johnny, is that the, 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 the Wall Street banks, according to the, the lawsuit, targeted black and brown homes. Mm -hmm. They targeted and took our homes away mm -hmm. with these balloon payments, right? right. And, and, come on, Johnny. They, they wiped us out. And I'm, I'm anxious not to, at all to debate with Mesra, but to figure out how we can get the, where's Dr. Plessa? Right, right there. The, tell me your, your pedigree, your, your education. Uh, my uh, undergraduate. Degree. You play football at Clemson, get that little part out the way. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> Benedict College undergraduate, physics, uh, Clemson University, marketing, MBA, Clark Atlanta University, and the first African American to graduate from Georgia Institute of Technology in the business school. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Now, the reason I, I, before you leave me, is what I asked him to do with his class is to do something big, figure out how the, the, the Georgia football stadium was financed. His class number, how do you finance? that stadium with the, with the least amount of money. Uh, Mr. Russell put up more money to build Pascal's and a, and a, and a, and a fifty room hotel than Blank to build the stadium. Now, wh what, what does that mean? As capital makes, say, say effort, effort and excellence, and excellence means, a means a lot. Inheritance, Inheritance. And, access and access means more. Means more. So the freedom laws are different than economic laws. So, John, say something, Dr. Mestre, because you, I'm just talking to you, you're a trained man. <laughs> yeah. 
I know Dr. Uh, uh, Mesra Barra Duran. I'm going to get your name right because it's a name you should never forget. Ladies and gentlemen, this is absolutely one of the most brilliant presentations I have yeah, ever yeah. heard. I mean, just absolutely one of the most brilliant. And there were a hundred points that I've got to rehear that I need to open up. So she took me to school like I've never been to school before. And um, years ago, my father and I were sued by Jesse Lee Peterson. Here's a guy that a former substance abuser that said he found Jesus Christ through Ronald Reagan. And he came to a conference very much like this in Los Angeles. We're talking about African-American ownerships and participation. He accused us of assault, battery, kidnapping, and six accounts. We went to lower court than Superior Court 111 in uh, Los Angeles. He was paid and supported by the Olin Foundation that she just showed you. And so I, why do I say that? Because all these movements of progress has enemies that are going to attack and destroy and disrupt everything that we're doing. Um, I can't help but think about Germany in 1990. It was like 82 million Germans, 16 million in East Germany, 63 plus or whatever in uh, West Germany. And when they said they were going to bring the wall down, what did they do? They put a trillion dollars on the table to integrate Eastern and Western Germany. I've had students now that are over the age of 25 from Germany that never heard of an East Germany. It was something that they, re they heard something about. But the trains and the schools and the water has already been fixed and solved. They have integrated their people. That would have been roughly 20% of their population. African Americans have been no more than 20%. We never got the economic mandate to get integrated into our economy. So I think you have laid out a framework. I can't thank you enough. I want to uh, get in your class. And uh, this is the purpose of the Wall Street Project in conclusion. She's not welcomed and sought after by Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, Wells Fargo. We're not in the conversation. They're not against us. They're not thinking about you. They're thinking about themselves and whatever else they can get from you. So come back next year. Bring a friend. Where else can we have this conversation? And then in reverence uh, attitude going forward, we have to demand access for these minds. We've got to take this back to the South. There's 400 years of Africans in America. It's after 300 years of black folks having been enslaved and sold in New York. We're not going to forget our history. I just got back from India. They are celebrating and honoring this entire year, the 150th birthday of Mahatma Gandhi. They don't let their historical figures die. I had to tell them this is the 90th birthday year of the Reverend Martin Luther King. How many of us are going to tell that to our children? 